In the previous video, we discussed a study looking at the association between phthalates and diabetes risk. But as you may have heard before, an association is not enough to implicate phthalates in the actual cause of diabetes. An association gets the ball rolling, but it doesn't have the power to prove beyond doubt that phthalates are detrimental to our health. So we need to empower ourselves with further research. In this video, we will discuss two studies that will offer us information on one, are phthalates truly the cause of increased diabetes risk? Two, what the mechanisms are within our body? How do phthalates enact their effects? And three, a potential protective substance that can be consumed that helps protect us from these detrimental effects. The first of our two studies used a simple, straightforward design, wherein they put mice on a standard mouse nutrition, but added two different concentrations of phthalates to their consumption. So one group consumed one milligram per kilogram of body weight's worth of phthalates, and the other group consumed 10 milligrams per kilogram. The researchers also had a third group that only consumed the standard nutrition with no exposure to phthalates. Then the researchers let the mice consume their respective nutrition for three months and made a variety of measures from blood sugar, insulin, and others. Now, I can already hear the groans of those that don't believe in animal studies because of the often overused argument that animals aren't humans. Now, that's a fair argument from time to time, but unless you'd like to sign up for a study to investigate the toxicity of a chemical in your body as it's fed to you for three months or longer, scientists do not have a choice. Personally, from a professional point of view, while animal studies should be contextualized, which I will do later, they are invaluable and can offer great information, and this is a perfect scenario. If you'd like a more nuanced explanation, head over to the deep dive version of this study breakdown. That said, what did they find? Well, it ain't good. The data shows two things. One, that phthalate exposure increases blood sugar levels, and two, that high phthalate exposure not only further increases blood sugar levels, but also increases blood insulin levels. As we've discussed before, if there is more insulin needed to control blood sugar in the normal range, you are more insulin resistant. But in this case, it's a double problem because not only is more insulin necessary, it doesn't even maintain the blood sugar within the normal range. To confirm this, we can look at the measure of insulin resistance. The higher the bar on the graph, the more insulin resistance. So according to multiple measures, insulin resistance is greater when exposed to more phthalates. Okay, so we see the more whole body effects of phthalates, but what exactly is happening within the tissues, within the cells that make up the body? Here's where things get a bit more complex. I'm going to show you some of the data illustrated across both studies, but rest assured, there's far more that I'm leaving out, so to keep this concise. And if you are a massive nerd like me and want a full deep dive, just look at the deep dive version for the nitty gritty glory. All right, so when we're discussing insulin resistance, what are we talking about within the cells? We're talking about a disruption of the signals within the cells of each tissue affected, like fat cells and liver cells, etc. Normally, you have an insulin molecule that binds to the exterior of the cell at the insulin receptor, and that receptor extends from the exterior of the cell into the cell, which signals a series of proteins, molecules, within the cell to interact until the end result leads to what's known as the translocation of a protein called GLUT to the surface of the cell. Said differently, the transport protein called GLUT is stuck inside the cell, in the cytosol of the cell. And when it is activated, it moves or translocates to the surface of the cell at the cell membrane. When it inserts itself in the cell membrane, blood sugar has a pathway for it to move from the blood to inside of the cell to be metabolized. That's what normally happens. but what do we see when the body is exposed to phthalates? Well, in fat cells, as one example, the insulin receptor is significantly reduced. So before I go on, I realize you might be scratching your head, unsure of how to read this. Okay, well, the darker and wider the smudge, the more of that molecule is present. 
So we see, as an example, the exposure to no phthalates, known as the control, shows a certain level of the insulin receptor presence, meaning the protein, the molecule, is there. If we slide over one, we see the levels are about the same with the exposure to one milligram of phthalates. However, we slide over to our final condition, we see that greater exposure to phthalates leads to a real loss of the protein. So if you have insulin circulating in the bloodstream, freshly released by your pancreas, where does it bind to allow the blood sugar in? Nowhere. That's why we see an elevated blood sugar, an elevated blood insulin. They're trapped in the bloodstream. Okay, one more. And trust me, there are about 10 of these measures, so I'm really trimming this down without misleading you. A key protein that facilitates the molecular signaling within the cells, translating the binding of insulin from the outside of the cell to allowing the glute protein to move to the cell membrane is a protein, a molecule known as AKT. Without AKT, the signal has difficulty translating into the actual changes within the cells. So if we go through the same process, we see AKT levels are high for the control, they're high for the one milligram exposure, and then they fall off a cliff in the 10 milligram condition. Clearly, phthalates are having an effect. Now, you're probably wondering why the one milligram condition didn't show any changes compared to the control. If you thought that, that's an excellent question. I can merely speculate, but it might be because there were no appreciable negative effects in fat cells, but there were negative effects in liver cells. For example, looking at the same AKT measure, there was a slight reduction compared to the control. So this would imply that the lower doses of phthalates might not negatively affect certain tissues while still having detrimental effects on other tissues while the higher exposure has a more widespread negative effect. This makes some sense considering the effects on insulin resistance were mild compared to the higher exposure. Still, even subtle effects aren't leading us in the right direction. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to quick confirm some of these results with the other study that I mentioned. In this study, the researchers used rats and used the higher dose of the first study as well as an extremely high dose of 100 milligrams. However, they show the same results when measuring the insulin receptor levels, a reduced level. Interestingly, they do not show the same effect on the total AKT levels, but they do show a reduced effect for the activated AKT levels. That's a whole other discussion, but ultimately, AKT can't just sit there inside your cells. It all also has to be activated through a process known as phosphorylation. Here we see its activation is reduced, even if its total amounts remain the same. So this data implies general agreement between the two studies. Now we know that insulin signaling is, in at least some of the molecules measured, screwed up due to phthalate exposure. What about the end result, though? What happens to the glute protein, the one that allows sugar into the cells, thereby reducing blood sugar? Here, again, we see reduced glute protein inside of the cell, the cytosol, but even more important, we see reduced levels in the cell membrane, which is where they are supposed to end up to allow sugar in. All right, now, I've been purposefully hiding one piece of data in this second study that I'm sure you'd find extremely intriguing. Let's unveil that. We looked at the insulin signaling within the cells that make up the tissues. That's what we just went over. However, the second study had a fourth condition. Beyond the phthalates, unexposed control, the 10 milligram exposure, and the whopping 100 milligram exposure. They also fed these animals to vitamins, vitamin C and E. And if we re-examine some of the same measures, like the insulin receptor levels, we'll see that all the way on the right, the vitamins recovered some of the receptor's expression compared to the two exposure conditions. Now, it did not bring it back up to the unexposed levels, but it was still an improvement, especially since they fed the animals these vitamins when the animals were being exposed to the maximum amount of phthalates. Now, one more, looking at the phosphorylated or activated AKT, we see a complete recovery, 
but did that functionally lead to any improvements in blood sugar uptake into the cells? Why, yes, yes it did. Glute proteins were partially recovered, and in measures of glucose entering the cells, a glucose uptake measure, there was a significant positive effect. So that's all great news. So up to now, we see that phthalates across multiple measures directly affect insulin sensitivity, increasing the risk of diabetes, according to these animal studies. While we can't jump to the conclusion with 100% certainty that this applies to humans, I do think there's a strong likelihood in this scenario. Between the studies mentioned last video and now this video, there's a good amount of evidence. Yet, I also added a potential solution by adding the data with the vitamin supplementation. But unfortunately, there's a bit more to the story than I let on. The vitamins aren't all sunshine and rainbows. And why did they work in the first place? Well, if you want to know how to reduce your phthalate levels, as well as complete the vitamin story, improve your insulin sensitivity, then I'd highly recommend the next video. I'll speak to you then. Bye.